1968's Planet of the Apes will forever be one of my favourite films. Despite very much feeling like a product of its time, Apes is in fact decades ahead of its time, and much like a lot of cult genre films, doesn't get the credit that it probably should. Planet of the Apes laid the groundwork for many aspects of modern cinema that we've become so familiar with today, both in the science fiction genre and the overall sense of the blockbuster. And with War for the Planet of the Apes right around the corner, it's important for us to look back and reflect at the legacy left behind by Planet of the Apes. What we know today as Planet of the Apes was born from the brain of acclaimed French author Pierre Boulle, then best known for his work The Bridge Over the River Kwai. In 1963 published La Planète des Scenes, or The Monkey Planet. Bull was inspired to write the novel after visiting the local zoo, where he recalled the human-like expressions of gorillas, contemplating the relationship between man and ape. Inspired by such work as Jonathan Swift's Gulliver's Travels, Bull's original novel discusses the failings of human nature and mankind's over-reliance on technology. La Planète des Scenes tells the tale of three human explorers who land on a planet orbiting the star Betelgeuse. Showtime. in which apes are the dominant species and humankind has been reduced to savage-like animals. While many aspects of the original novel were changed upon its adaptation to the big screen, the central themes of what became Planet of the Apes can very much be found in Bull's original work. And while the book was met with high praise upon its release, with the Encyclopedia of Science Fiction describing it as a witty philosophical tale a la Voltaire, full of irony and compassion, Bull considered it to be one of his lesser works, and nothing of considerable note. However, while Bull seemed to dismiss La Planète des Scenes, there were many people who deemed it a masterpiece and sought to bring the sci-fi novel to the big screen. One of these people, for instance, was Alan Bernheim, Bull's own literary agent, who brought the novel to the attention of American film producer Arthur P. Jacobs, who had recently come to Paris looking for new properties to adapt with his company APJAC Productions. Jacobs was looking for a franchise akin to the classic King Kong series, and as a result, Bernheim mentioned Bull's novel, not expecting Jacobs would actually be interested in the property. However, Jacob, intrigued by the fantastical premise, bought the film rights almost immediately before the book's publication in 1963. After securing the rights to the novel, Jacob pitched the production to many studios, but received little interest. And it was only after he saw success producing Fox's What A Way To Go in 1964, that he became able to finally bring apes to life, with Fox Vice President Richard Zanuck finally greenlighting the project. In order to capture the futuristic science fiction tone of the novel, Twilight Zone creator Rod Serling was brought on to pen the screenplay in early 1964. While Serling admired Bull's original story, he felt there were several important changes that needed to be made. He later told Cinefantastique that, as talented and creative a man as Bull is, he does not have the deafness of a science fiction writer. Bull's book was not a parody, but rather a prolonged allegory about morality, more than it was a stunning science fiction piece. But it contained within its structure a walloping science fiction idea. As a result, Serling oversaw major changes in translating the story of Planet of the Apes to cinema. For instance, one notable change was the ending of the movie. Bull's original novel saw protagonist Ulysses escape from the planet and return to Earth, only to find a similar fate awaiting him, which was later adapted into Tim Burton's 2001 remake. But Serling sought to invent a new twist ending to shock audiences, and what Serling eventually came up with became one of the most iconic twist endings in cinematic history, as Captain George Taylor discovers the ruined Statue of Liberty, realising that instead of landing on a distant world, he instead landed home on Earth. Around this time, Ben Hur star Charlton Heston was brought onto the project to star in the lead role after being intrigued by the film's concept by Jacobs, who in turn suggested bringing in director Franklin J. Schaffner. With a rough draft of the final script submitted by Serling, a director and a lead actor in place, 
A test screen was shot in order to convince 20th Century Fox that the film could succeed. Heston played the role of Thomas, later renamed Taylor, and veteran actor Edward G. Robinson was recruited to play the role of Dr. Zaius. While Fox were enthused by the screen test and encouraged the filmmakers to go ahead with their vision, they were concerned with the more technologically advanced ape society which Serling had written, much like how the apes were described in Bull's novel, believing that it would be too expensive to film. As a result, Fox reduced the budget of the film down to 5.8 million and hired veteran writer Michael Wilson to rework Serling's screenplay. In order to save on special effects costs, Wilson's script changed the ape society into a more primitive and rudimentary one, removing much of the science fiction elements while also reworking much of the film's dialogue while still retaining Serling's proposed ending, as well as the heavy themes of social commentary from Serling's original draft. Social commentary played an interesting role in shaping the story of apes. In both the film and Bull's novel, many thematic elements sought to discuss the state of society during the 1960s. At the time of the film's release, America was going through a political and social breakdown, Involvement in Vietnam had increased rapidly as the North Vietnamese Army launched the Tet Offensive. The nation was grieving over the deaths of political figures such as John F. Kennedy and Martin Luther King Jr. And the struggle for black equality continued, all while the Cold War continued to escalate and the risk of mutually assured destruction continued to loom over the world's shoulders. In Eric Green's work, Planet of the Apes as American Myth, he describes the film as a political allegory for racial conflict, one which created fictional spaces whose social tensions resembled those dominating the United States, allowing the filmmakers the chance to discuss these real life issues through the lens of science fiction. The genre has always been used to explore the problems with our world from a different perspective, and Planet of the Apes is a prime example of this. With the films presenting humans as the subdominant species in comparison to apes, it plays on the idea of segregation and the struggle for equality which was still going on in 1968, looking at how humans are treated as second class citizens by the apes and are considered inferior to the apes. It's about how power corrupts and can be used unjustly by those who have it, and that one isn't always aware of injustice until they experience it themselves. Characterised by Dr. Zira and Cornelius, and their relationship with Taylor. In a much broader sense, the film discusses the grim future which many deem to lay ahead for the United States, and also the world. Green describes it as a gloomy account of America's constant failure to solve its issues within the context of a racial, societal and political apocalypse, and how this instability reflects the struggles within our own society, and this was captured perfectly by the film's final image, the fallen Statue of Liberty, representing the loss of values, ideals and innocence by decades of unjust wars and a lack of equality for all. When Planet of the Apes was finally released in theatres in February 1968, it quickly became one of the most popular movies of the year, grossing over $30 million on its $5 million budget. And in addition, the film became something of a pop culture touchstone, setting the standard for aspiring science fiction films that would follow it, while serving as a mirror to our society asking questions about the conflicts within humanity, all through a wildly outlandish and outrageous premise. And I think that's why the ending in particular became so iconic over time, while throughout the film we follow Taylor on his quest to escape from the world of apes and return home to Earth. This revelation flips the premise on its head entirely, painting the film in colours all too familiar for contemporary audiences. It's revealed that the antagonistic apes didn't destroy human society, and instead the humans did, and through the exact same circumstances the audiences of the late 1960s had feared. When Taylor says the infamous line, Damn you all to hell! It's unclear as to whether he's referring to the apes, or to the humans. Throughout the film, Taylor is depicted as a cynic, someone disconnected and disillusioned, with human society, and this gut-wrenching revelation brings him, and the audience with him, to his knees, realising that humanity's worst fears have been exercised, and as a result, 
caused their own destruction. Much like Bull's original novel, the film serves as a grim warning about humanity's future, but while Bull believed human civilization would fall just as all civilizations do over time, the filmmakers sought to warn us that the biggest danger we face isn't so much that of nuclear war, but more so the ignorance and intolerance of one another. While mutually assured destruction is the danger, it can only be acted upon by the worst characteristics of ourselves. By displaying the worst parts of our humanity as the cause of our own demise, the film reminds us that the world existed before humanity and likely will exist after humanity, and that we as a species embody both the best and the worst of ourselves. As Taylor states in the opening sequence, somewhere in the universe, there must be something better than man. And maybe that something just is a planet of the apes. Hey guys, thanks for checking out today's video. I hope you enjoyed it. I've been waiting for a long time to talk about Planet of the Apes. The original 1968 movie is one of my favourites, and with War for the Planet of the Apes out very soon, I figured it'd be the perfect time to finally get round to discussing this amazing film. If you enjoyed this video, please make sure to like, comment, and subscribe to the channel for more case studies like this one. And there are some more videos on screen right now, like this one, that you may enjoy. You can follow me on Twitter at Owen Likes Comics. And I'll see you next time. So until then, take care and keep reading.